So we're starting on the introduction page. Yes, you and we were talking about last week. Last week we talked about it is written. And then Dorothy was saying, well, sometimes there's just things in Romans, that book, that are difficult to understand even when you read them. So I got to looking at it, and I didn't get past chapter, chapter one to have enough to have a whole lesson on. So in this little Calvin and Hobbes thing here, uh, <clears throat> Hobbes has been wrestling, I mean, Calvin has been wrestling with somebody in the mud, it looks like, he's all dirty. And he comes up to the girl and says, Susie and says, she says, what happened to you? And he says, Hobbes and I had a frank exchange of ideas. And then he looks at her and says, what are you doing? Homework? And she said, I wasn't sure I understood this chapter. So I reviewed my notes from the last chapter, and now I'm rereading this. And Calvin says, you do all that? And she says, well, now I understand it. And then he says, huh, I used to think you were smart. <laughs> Calvin doesn't think it's smart to work to understand anything. Sometimes translation of the Bible, translators, or a translation like King James or whatever, and they use a word or phrase that's difficult to understand. So we work to find out the meaning, like Susie was working to understand whatever lesson she was trying to get. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 14, the word L-E-T, let, is difficult to understand. And we would say, well, we all know what let means. Yeah. Give permission. Romans 1, 13. Let's read that. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Was let hitherto. Yeah. Well, we've been talking about it all week. Been digging, working like Susie to find out what it meant. It is obvious what Paul meant when he wrote that he was let, is it? Well, it wasn't to me. And rereading it didn't help. Just, I finally found that in British law, let means interference or being interfered with as when one country refuses to honor another country's passport. Now, that passport is supposed to pass you through. through, and this country says, nope, we're not honoring passports from your country. They're not letting you. Well, but the way they use the word, and it's a law word, and when they get into international law and argue it in courts, they use that word to mean prevented or hindered, or we wouldn't let you do it. The modern King James Version says Paul was kept back. Well, now that's clear enough, but I, I didn't have a modern King James <laughs> translation. I had, oh my goodness, I had King James and New King James and uh, American Standard and the uh, uh, the common English version, and I, I mean, 
None of them said kept back. And then I got to modern translations, and they use so many different words. You wonder whether sometimes whether you're reading the same verse. Uh, so, anyway, that's an example of why, like Susie, sometimes we have to really dig to find something. And I went through all, like getting on the internet and asking what was the meaning, you define the word L-E-T. And I didn't get this thing, this answer about let, uh, being hindered. I got everything else. And it's used a whole bunch of different ways. And I found a, some statement about a passport and, and letting about law. And that's where I started digging, and from there I was able to go further. But uh, that's not what we commonly do. We just look at a dictionary and say, let, to allow. <laughs> well, in this case, it means not to allow. 2 Timothy 2.7, down in the bottom right. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding in all things. Now, I think Paul was kind of like praying, or may the Lord give you understanding, but he was writing to Timothy, and he was, he was, what he said was what he was writing in his letter to Timothy. Uh, so we use the word say sometimes when we're writing to somebody. Yeah. We're going to go now to the main lesson, the folded sheet. Page one, June 30th, 2024, F5. Difficulties in Romans chapter one. And as I was looking through Romans to see what possible difficulties <laughs> there could be to just reading it and understanding it, I came to verse 13. That's one verse past what George read. Let's read the verse. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto. And uh, the, that word let was used in the New King James. It was used in the American Standard. It, you know. And so there's a Greek word. I looked up the Greek. Some of us like the Greek. And it's echo luthane. Echo what? Echo luthane. That's as good as I can pronounce it. Is that that? That's that funny looking word there, yes. In front of your phone. It means forbidden or prevented. So the point is that God didn't let him go. Paul planned to go to Rome, but God prevented him. The Holy Spirit prevented him because he had something else for Paul to do right then. So not only was the word let difficult because it was an English word that we didn't get, but it also kind of, because it was that way, you, you, you hit the question, well, when you get that, it kind of means I purposed to come to you, but I wasn't let to come to you. I, I, I wasn't allowed to come to you. I was hindered from coming to you. Well, who hindered him? God did. Now, God doesn't have to explain himself. After a while, God allowed him to go to Rome. Paul, 
Paul had prayed that he would have a prosperous journey. And he asked people to pray for him that he would have a prosperous journey to Rome. And he had a horrible journey to Rome as a prisoner in a ship that everybody thought was going to sink and they were all going to die. Wound up on an island bitten by snakes. You know, he didn't ask for that. We're not entirely sure why it all worked out that way. People have theories. But the point is, Paul's plans weren't always the same as God's plans. And further, just because we ask God for a pleasant trip doesn't mean we're going to have one. It's, it's not like God just gives us whatever we ask for. Or if four of us pray together for it, we'll automatically get it. And that's hard for us to understand sometimes. That, uh, sometimes they use the phrase, some people think that God is a gimme God. He just, give me this, give me that, give me the other. Then people get off track. And they start asking for money and wealth and power and things that they don't really need that wouldn't have anything to do with their salvation. So if nothing else, what happened when he wasn't allowed to go was a reminder to him, Paul, that God was in charge of what Paul did. Not Paul. God was in charge. Number two, how was Paul debtor to the Greeks, the barbarians, the wise, and the unwise? Well, verse 14, let's read that. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Well, did that mean he owed them money? He owed them something. He owed them something. Well, there's another Greek word there. And it means owing a debt, but it's not limited to money. You can owe somebody a debt because they helped you, and you say, I owe you one. In a good way. I look forward to the chance to help you out sometime. Well, Paul was debtor. But look who he was debtor to. The Greeks, which was, and to the barbarians. Everybody in the world. Whether they were wise or whether they were unwise. Whether they were Calvin or whether they were Susie. Whether they read a lot or whether they didn't read a lot. Whether they listened a lot, whether they didn't listen a lot. You know, whoever and however. He said, I'm a debtor to everybody. Well, 1 Corinthians 9, 16, and 17 shows us that he had one debt that he definitely had was the debt to preach to them. 1 Corinthians 9, 16, and 17. Let's read that. But though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing, un if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. It, it, it didn't matter whether he felt like it or not. If, if the Spirit told him to go over there and preach, had to get him up and go over there and preach whether he felt good or not. I imagine after he was stoned and left for dead, he didn't feel very good. 
But he got up and he said things and he told people things. He had an obligation to preach. And so he owed that obligation to people that were Greeks, people that were Jews, people that were barbarians who had never heard of the living God. He had a, that necessity to preach to those philosophers that he met who thought they knew everything, the wise, and to the foolish who let everybody tell them what to think. He preached to them all. And the book of Acts is about that. And Corinth was one of the places you can read in the Bible where he did exactly that. He preached to Greeks and to Jews and to wise and to unwise and all that. So that's how he was a debtor to them. He owed them that because God put that debt on him. Number three. Page two. What does it mean that God revealed his righteousness from faith to faith? I hear that mentioned in sermons from time to time at different places. And I heard them growing up. And I can remember, well, this preacher said it meant this. And this preacher said it meant this. And the last time I heard it, they were absolutely sure that it meant this. Romans 1, 17 and 18. Let's read that. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, what he's talking about is the gospel, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Well, some people say it means the faith of the Old Testament to the faith in the New Testament. Well, I've heard that. And some say it's from the faithfulness of God to man's faith in God. And, and then there's one, I, I always lose quite what it means, but like from the faith we have now until the fulfillment of our faith in salvation. And here's the point. In all of those things, God's righteousness is revealed. His righteousness is revealed to the faithful people in the Old Testament. Anybody can go back there and read about it. And God's righteousness is revealed to the faithful people in the New Testament. We can read about it. God's faithfulness is a one-in-one -one relationship to people being faithful to him. And the faith that we have now does and is supposed to last until it's fulfilled in eternity. But if we simply look at the end of verse 17 up there, just above us, it says, the just shall live by faith. That's the issue. What he wants me to get. The just shall live by faith. 
if I'm doing that, then whatever faith to faith it means, it's going to be good for me. If I'm not living by faith, then verse 12, the wrath of God is revealed against me. I'm sorry, verse 18. The, the, the verse is right above us, right above where we're reading. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. We were, I was thinking about what that means to hold the truth in unrighteousness. And in a lesson I'm preparing for someone else, somewhere else, I came across a woman named Amy Semple MacPherson. And Amy Semple MacPherson was born in 1898. When she was 17, she started preaching, as she called it. And her background was primarily what's called the Pentecostal movement. But she was never fully in it. She would step over this way from it. She was, by the world's standard, an extremely good woman. She did and good works till she just wore herself out, finally died from it. She was accused falsely by all kind of people, but she moved to California in 1920. And people started saying, ah, oh, she's healed me. So she decided that God healed people through her, miraculously. And times were pretty hard then, and so lots and lots of people came. And she took donations, solicited them from all over the country, and built the... Cathedral? Yeah, and it meant that the temple or th theater of angels and, and created what is today called the first mega church. You talk about industrious, at times she preached 21 times a week there. And on Sundays, there were as many as 12,000 people came to hear her. But she went with the dramatic, you see. She, uh, Hollywood, extravaganzas, uh, uh, Hollywood style of this and that and the other. She, she began to modify the Bible in her thinking by saying, well, that was certainly true then, but we need to kind of get the Bible to agree with what we're doing now. We need to get the Bible to agree with what we're doing now. And so she began to shave a little bit of truth off here, shave a little bit of truth off there, shave a little bit of truth off somewhere else. She made lots and lots of enemies. All, for some reason, all the reporters and all the police disliked her. They accused her of everything in the world and never proved any of it. All the charges that were ever brought against her were thrown out of court. She could have been guilty. She might have been innocent. Who was going to court against her? Reporters. 
were filing complaints and then forcing the police to take action against her. They were swearing out statements from people that when they were statements were investigated, they couldn't be proven. The, the point is, she held the truth in unrighteousness. Why go to all that work and not just simply teach the truth? Her, her sermons kind of became, the, the climax of her sermons were her discerning that there were people among the audience who had the power of healing and if you would go get by him or her, God might heal you. Mm. Well, see, if you read in the Bible, that's not there. But she, she would take a, a miracle and kind of redress it and run it out and say, well, it happens today through Mr. Smith or Mrs. Jones or whatever. And of course, with thousands of people coming through there, there were people who said, aha, I'm healed. And then thousands more would come. Were they ever verified? They tried that. And the trouble was uh, that the people claimed they were healed. Claimed they were? They were healed. They were. That's what the people claimed. But they were for things like, I've been having indigestion, or I've been depressed. You know, I've been down on my luck. And, and all of that was mashed together. The, the point is, when we look at these in Romans 1, 17 and 18, they're on page 2, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And it's written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So the thing is, the challenge is, to live by faith, to try to live by faith. And thus, last week's lesson, it is written. That's what Jesus was giving us a model of. It is written, Satan. It is written, Satan. My father says, Satan. The Bible says, Satan. It's written in the Bible. I trust the Bible. What he was saying after that was the just. Well, the thing is that Amy Simple McPherson didn't go there. She went over to the side and she used a little Bible and a lot of Amy Simple McPherson and some of the Pentecostal doctrine and some of the Methodist doctrine just pick and choose what you want and put it all together. Whatever the people wanted that would draw them to her, to her mega church, was good. And would save them because Amy Simple McPherson said so. You know, not, not the way to go. Number four. How is what may be known of God made manifest or clear in all unrighteous people? Romans 1, 19 and 20. Let's read that. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them for the invisible things of him 
from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. I've heard lots of different claims made about that. Let's turn to page three. Turn this sheet over and go to page three. Without the Bible, all may see God's power and Godhead from within themselves. They may, however, wear blindfolds. People, uh, I, uh, I have statements from scientists back over there somewhere, all kind of scientists, who, when they looked at the human body, quit being atheists and started being believers because the human body was so absolutely, amazingly, impossible to exist by accident. They didn't have blinders on. They set aside all the godless evolution that they were taught in school and said, wait a minute. <laughs> no, 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 no. God had to have made a human being within ourselves. that fabulous breath of life, that which God at the beginning breathed into the nostrils of a lump of clay and made him people, made an Adam, made an Adam who could name all the animals on the first day. I think we tried that. We couldn't do it. We couldn't do it whether we're young or old. We don't know what all the animals are. <laughs> and he named them all, however many they were, he named them on the first day. And he could talk. Talking was a miracle. It wasn't a, something that man came to through millions of years. He could talk the first day. We're not, we're talking about the top of page three. About this, that it is within themselves. That's what the scripture there said. It, the witness is in themselves. It doesn't say it's all out there for them to see, though that's part of it. But it's within themselves. The miracle of sight, uh, the miracle of speech, the miracle of mind. Now let's look at Acts 14, verse 17 there. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons filling our hearts with food and gladness. And that's the external part of all this witness. Just look. Through good times and bad times, man has survived. We probably all had times when what we ate was as cheap as we could get by with because times were really hard. And maybe once in a while, we've had times where we kind of splurged, you know? And that was good, too. But all those good things, the things we barely got by on, they still came from God. Number five. Still in Romans chapter 1, what does it mean that God gave them up? Romans 1.24, let's read that. 
Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. God gave them up. There's people today who say God doesn't give anybody up. Well, wait a minute. Amy Simple McPherson said no, God didn't give anybody up. The Bible says God gave some people up. Well, who did he give up? Let's look at Romans 1, 29 through 31 and read it there. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. I think we read all of it. Yeah. So, God gave those people up. Why? <laughs> because of their overflowing devotion to sin. They had no use for God or the truth or for righteousness or for doing anything that was right about anything and seemingly were just deliberately the opposite. And God gave them up. That's a very profound thing. But there's some witness of that, I believe, in the New Testament. When Jesus was speaking to the Jews who later crucified him. Those particular ones. He said, where I go, you cannot come. I believe that my personal feeling is that was the judgment of God against those people. That, that Jesus Christ was judging the people who crucified him. He said, where I go, you cannot come. It's not on here. The point is, they weren't going to get to go where Jesus was going. Where was Jesus going? To heaven. To be with his Father. And he had people on earth that he looked in the eye, if you would, and said, you can't come. Look what he said about Judas. It is better for that one if he had never been born. I don't think we ought to expect to see Judas Iscariot in heaven. God does give up people. You can look at the Old Testament and you can see times when the Jews were so awful, so rebellious, so wicked that God gave them up, finally just turned his back on them and said, I will not hear you. If you pray to me, I will close my eyes and my ears to you. That's giving somebody up. Or it matters. People say that it didn't matter. <laughs> yeah. But it's very important that if we've, you know, the thing is, as an individual, a person can leave being given up by God and they can come over and be in the place 
where they're received by God. But they have to give up their, their willfulness in sin. Witness of that in, in, in the book of Acts, it talks about a great company of priests believed and were baptized. Oh, wait a minute, the priests were part of the crucifixion. The priests were against Jesus. But apparently some of them repented of that. Acts, the second chapter, people who with wicked hands crucified the Savior, repented and were baptized. Their sins were remitted and they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Remitted means unforgiven. Forgiven. Paid. Page four. So summarizing point number five. God gave them up to their sin, to their continuing rejection of him. He didn't take away the gospel, but then the gospel benefits those who believe and obey. Number six, they sin and also have pleasure in them that sin. And then that it's a little bit difficult. It wouldn't, you know, well, if they do the sin anyway, what difference does it matter if they have pleasure in those that do the sin? And yet, it's stated that way right here in the book of Romans, verse 32. Let's read that verse. Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What such people do not only condemns themselves, but draws others into condemnation also. They're not just condemning themselves by their sin, but they're drawing other people Satan's way. They're drawing other people into the sin against God, into destruction. Does verse 30 describe those people? I'm sorry? Does verse 30 of Romans 1 describe the ones you're talking about? Yeah, any of those things. All of those things, any of those things, it, such people know the judgment of God, but they're going to do it anyway, and they're going to draw other people to hell with them, if you would. Number seven, the gospel cure. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all that believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power of overcoming sin, the power of getting on the right side with God and away from sin is through the gospel. And now, having said this, George is going to lead us. We're going to turn to the back side of this sheet we began with and read the first seven verses of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul's letter to Rome and to us. Let's begin. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, having been separated unto the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, 
according concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh, who was declared son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we apostles have received grace and apostleship for the obedience of faith among all the nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all those who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Those first <clears throat> seven verses of Romans tell us the theme of the book of Romans, what he's going to be talking about. And what he's going to be talking about is the power and the resurrection from the dead of Jesus Christ and the grace and the obedience of faith that's been offered unto all people that we could become the called, the called of God, the called of Jesus Christ. Whether we're in Rome, a city of terrible sin, or whether we're here today, we're called to be saints, to have grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So having said that, maybe overall then, we could read the first chapter of Romans and have a clearer understanding of it. When there are things that we don't understand, we do like Susie in that little cartoon, and we go back and we reread it. And then we think about it. We go back and read something else that we think has to do with it like she did. And hopefully we come to an understanding. And somebody else can look at us and say, well, you're not so smart, are you? But no, yes, we are. That's the smart thing to do, to read and work on it and if I don't understand something, don't just slip over it. Because if I keep slipping over it, then I'm open prey to somebody like Amy Simple McPherson. And she, she was full of hope and optimism and glory to God and everything is going to be good and everything's going to turn out right. And if it's not right, let's help you. Uh, it, it, it was a wonderful thing that she was about. But she wasn't God. She wasn't God, and, and it wasn't Scripture that she was teaching. And even in those fundamentals, to hear God's Word, to be called by the Gospel, to be called not by the works that people do, but by the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. To understand truly what sin is and that God can just turn his back on us. And we need to come over into the place where God is and believe and obey him. If we can help you with your soul's salvation, we're, we're going to stand now and sing number 23 in the white books. Number 23. And if we can help you with your soul's salvation, we ask that you make your needs known while we stand and sing. Someday I'm going to heaven. Beautiful heaven somewhere. 
Someday I'm going to heaven, leaving a world full of care. There, there will be no more sighing. There, there will be no more fears. There, with the Savior to comfort, there, there will be no more tears. Sometimes the burdens are heavy, sometimes just too much to bear. Then as the world falls around me, no one, it seems, really cares. Where for my tears is there comfort? When through the long night I cry, that's when I need to feel Jesus. Comfort my soul with his sigh. Someday I'm going to heaven, beautiful heaven somewhere. Won't you go with me to heaven? Jesus, our Savior, waits there. Free from all pain and all sorrow, living in peace up above. Free from all sin and all anguish, Safe in the joys of God's love. In the front of our books is the Lord's Prayer. Let's say that and then we'll ask George to lead us in a closing prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdoms come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Again, we thank you for this day and for allowing us to be here in your house of worship, singing you songs of praise and worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, dear Lord, for today's lesson and for allowing Brother Ed to be with us again on this, this Lord's Day to deliver your message and to guide us in the teaching and understanding of your word. We pray, dear Lord, that as we depart from here, that you will be with Brother Ed and his family, uh, the members of this congregation and their families, that you will watch over us and that you will keep us under your protection and help to keep us safe, happy, and healthy. If it is your will, dear Lord, we pray that you will allow us to return here on next Lord's Day. We prayed for Sister Betty and that you will continue to be with her, and that if it is your will that you will return, to, to return her back to this congregation on next Lord's Day. We pray that as Christians that we will continue to find guidance, strength, courage, and comfort in, our word, in your word. We pray that when we face the temptation of sin that we will find, uh, <clears throat> find the will to overcome. We pray that through our actions and deeds that we can somehow inspire others to seek you out. We pray and thank you for your undying love and we pray that as Christians that we can somehow even uh, express a portion of that love to our fellow man. We also pray the Lord that 
when our time here on earth comes to an end, that we have lived our lives in a manner that has gained us a place by your side in your kingdom of heaven. We know that you hear all prayers, dear Lord, and that if it is your will, it will be done. Thank you for the sacrifice that was made by your son and our savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for the remission of our sins to give us that avenue of forgiveness. This prayer we say in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.